He's out of a comic book, I mean, in reality, you know. John's like a, a comic book character. He's not anything real, you know what I mean? The only thing is, he is real. He's a New York gang expert who runs neighborhood martial arts schools that keeps kids off the streets. Here we go. I think he's okay. Some people want to kill him. You ask anybody who's born and raised right here, they, they know that name. They know John McCann. Gang members have been shot. Gang members have been killed. Gang members have been stabbed. When I got involved with gangs, I was 12 years old. And as far as gangs in the neighborhood, there were about 20 that I can remember. Everywhere you went, every five blocks, six blocks, here and there, whatever direction, was a different gang. And the um, majority of the time, we had to spend it in the area where we picked out as our turf because uh, if we stepped out of, the, out of the boundaries, we would walk into another gang's turf and you would be taking a risk. What uh, gang were you involved in? I was in the Assassinators. I met John uh, in 1982 when I became the commanding officer of the 72nd Precinct. Uh, John was an officer assigned into the precinct. And uh, he was well known at the time. He was assigned uh, to foot patrol, and that's where I met him. Well, I went out that night. I was up on the roofs, and I don't know if you've ever been on a roof uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning in the summer. You can hear everything that's being said downstairs. I, I'm down there, and this blue Lincoln pulls up, and he meets with Medina, and, I, and they started talking, and I picked up the conversation that Medina was going to give him $5,000 down and $10,000 upon completion. It was a hit on me. So I took the plate number, and uh, I went into the department, and I told them, you know, Medina just bought a hit on me, you know, and they want to send the intelligence division and give a walkie-talkie to your mother, and, you know, protect you. You know, the intelligence division protects you. How do you protect me when you're sitting in your fucking ass in Manhattan on a desk, you know? That's a lot of shit. And uh, they said, well, you know, we want you to do this and we want you to do that until we can take care of this. I said, fuck you, I'll take care of this. And they said, we don't want you to take care of this. I said, good. Well, to make a long story short, that hit man uh, lived in Williamsburg. Seems that one night he was coming out of his house and some ninja in black cut off all his fingers. Man with no fingers pulls no triggers. We looked at John and respected him a lot more, not because of the badge, but because of the way he treated us. Well, John, what you would have to know was a complete, complete loner in the job, you know what I mean, what he did. And how did the, uh, his fellow police officers feel about his relationships with the gangs? Right, some of them uh, thought that, you know, he was doing a good job, and others looked uh, at him like he was like a traitor to the police, uh, you know, that he was talking to these young people and uh, what have you. So it was a mixed reaction. I don't care what they say. I cleaned up them fucking streets and I made the neighborhood safe. And every time I put one of them gentlemen in jail, I felt good. I mean, then I went home and had a good night's sleep. Every time I made the streets a little bit safer for the public, and for the godchildren that I had on these streets now, I just slept a little better that night. I felt good. They called him Psycho Cop. He did things that people wouldn't even believe. Um, he, he was, um, he's unreal. I really can't, I can't, I don't got no words to explain John the Cop. John the Cop is and will be this legend. Uh, you could interview some of the kids that are now adults that they would tell you in very, very strong terms that their life was turned around by John Maniel. And I'm not talking about a few, I'm talking about dozens. John, uh, I'm not used to calling him John, it's usually Shihan, Kiyoshi, or Shidoshi. <laughs> uh, Shidoshi uh, was a, um, although he was very disciplined and very hard on the mat and, you know, uh, straightforward fighting and, and uh, you know, it, although that was the class, after class, you know, 
it was everything was relaxed. You could sit down, talk to him, and and you could uh, have a real good conversation with him, you know. And he was, I don't know, like they see back in the old days. Uh, he was a homeboy. It was about uh, 20 years ago. I was about 17 years old, and on 46th Street between 6th and 7th in the Sunset Park area of Brooklyn, there was a karate school that opened up, and a friend of mine had said. Um, this police officer opened up a school, I, I think you should come check it out. So, like I said, I went down there, I took a couple of classes, I got, I got to liken the karate system, and I grew an attachment like to John. I, it was like, almost like a father image. Sit! Sit down! Hey! Oh. He loves karate. Mm -hmm. My Johnny is a terrific karate. I went to school to see him, my mother, we all went. And he was breaking boards, and I yelled to the good people, that's why he's crazy. He said he hits the board on his head. His mother was a, a very uh, strong-willed person, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say so. <laughs> Do you know her? Oh, well, yes, yes, I knew her very well. Mm -hmm. One of the cop members told me, I would never get involved, let them kill themselves, you know? And I look at the guy, the little guy with toes, you know, I can't believe it, you know? And uh, John always used to help everybody out, you know? I guess a lot of the cops had it against him, you know, what, what he used to do, you know? I don't know. His own police department disliked him for the way he did it. Because he would get dressed up in a ninja uniform after working hours. And his shift would go 4 to 12. He would go from 12 till 6 in the morning going after these gangs. And he would stop them. And they were afraid of him. They're still afraid of him today. I don't like to see bad guys get over. It's that serious. And if that makes me a psycho, then fuck it, I'm a psycho. But there was a gang over here on 26th Street and 4th Avenue, and what they did was basically taken over a couple of abandoned apartments there. When I was speaking about John in the past, I made it make him sound like a social worker. That's, that's not exactly what it was like then. Uh, they, they moved into a couple of abandoned apartments. Uh, uh, the landlord, at the landlord's request, he had asked that we do something about this particular gang. Uh, we knew they were armed. They had rifles. They had whatever. Uh, uh, I remember John going there on his own and uh, basically going in to take this whole group out of there, I guess, because he was going to talk them out of there, and they were not ready to leave. And I went there as a, a backup, and what ended up happening, we ended up with uh, John arresting about 20 people. And then we didn't have any way to transport them into the station house, so we had to march them along 4th Avenue because we had too many and didn't have the number of cars there. Uh, I'm sure John would remember this incident a lot clearer than I do. So. The best way to humiliate him was to kill that macho thing. So what I used to do is uh, I would call the radio cars, take all the cuffs from the other cops, cuff them together in a chain, and then sit on the back of a radio car and hold the front cuff and march him through the streets all the way down to the precinct. What everybody laughing at him and humiliate him. I'm sure you didn't make much... Uh many friends than when you did that. I wasn't out to win a popularity contest with those guys. All the guys cuffed together. Yeah. Who was at the end? They were all marching on 4th Avenue. And one guy said to John, he said, John, right? They were all shackled. He says, this is humiliating. John says, you got it. Well, it was, the point wasn't humiliating. and we had no other way of transporting them. And, and we, it was unsafe for us to stay at the uh, that particular location any longer. So we had to get them out of there. And, uh, walking them in was the only way we, we had at the particular time because we didn't have enough cars to bring them in. It's not a pretty picture. I can't paint every single thing I went through uh, the time I was in a gang, but, you know, there were some times when um, suicide was about the best way out. And thank God I was either too dumb or I just couldn't get a hold of something to do it with that I didn't go through with it. But, I mean, there are times when somebody really, really thinks about taking their lives because it, it looks like there's nothing else there for them. And that wasn't just because of the gangs, though. No, not because of the gangs. There's a lot of other things that could make a person come down, you know? Mm -hmm. You get you get community rejection. You get, uh, maybe you ain't got no nowhere to go for work or things like that, you know? You're stuck. Mm -hmm. if, if you start thinking that there's nothing for you by what you're doing now, you kind of give up on yourself. I used to take the gang members in here and buy them pizza and soda, and uh, you'd be surprised how when they're sitting at a booth with you, out of uniform, and they're, and they're eating, they talk differently. They tell you things that they wouldn't tell you. Same guys sitting there in uniform, they wouldn't say. Same guys sitting there out of uniform, they tell you everything. What kind of things would they tell you? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot of times they used to fight. 
They used to chase them inside a the pizzeria. They used to come down there, you know, with knife and guns. And you know, like sometimes, sometimes, you know, I used to know them, you know. There was a couple of guys, twin brothers, they used to call them on 49th Street. And they used to tell them, you know, don't fight it, you know, take it outside, fight outside, you know. And they used to let them go, and they used to fight around the corner. They used to have shootouts, you know, stabbing, all kinds of things. The store owners, I think they loved me. I think about 90% of the community loved me. Because I stopped their burglaries, and I stopped uh, their rip-offs, and I stopped, you know, the shootouts in the middle of the street. So I think they liked me. They all said they did. <laughs> I don't like him myself. Some people in the familia think he's okay. Some people want to kill him. I got a reputation probably being the biggest scumbag fucking cop in the city. But you know with who? With the people I locked up, with the bad guys, with my enemies. And you know how many of them get out of jail, come into school, shake my fucking hand, tell me I did him a favor? Two brothers were the leaders of the Masateros. All right. The twins. Yeah, that's right. How you doing? Good. Good to Good. see you. Wow, yeah. same here. How's your brothers? Same here. Well, one of them is locked up, like wow. usually. Um, doesn't stay out of jail. Um, the other one went up to get a new life in North Carolina. Married, has children, staying up there. As a result of my insanity in all the years at Sunset Park, I'm coming up on two years drug-free. Oh, great. I'm trying to do the right thing for once in my life. So great. how do you know John? John was the neighborhood cop when I was going to junior high school in Dewey. And did you, how did you feel about him? Um, he, he tried to look out for all the youth that were um, growing up in Sunset Park. And, um, and he tried to do the right thing. At the time, I had a club called the Nonstop Dancers, where there was a lot of shooting and a lot of illegal guns and stuff. And, and John busted me for that for having young kids play hooky and come into that club that was supposed to be a dance club and it turned out to be a gang club. But John was really on the tail. We had a young kid that blew off his fingers with a sort of shotgun and this was in the process of, of fighting with other gang members from the neighborhood. So how, how do you, do you feel that John had an influence in yeah, your life? A great influence. Can you tell me about that? Um, the influence that John had in my life was that I was doing the wrong thing, but because of the different folks that I hung out with, I thought I was doing the right thing. And John always tried to lead us to the right thing, you understand? Good, positive things. Karate, you know, um, getting things to keep the youth out of the street. Like this, right? And what does this do, gentlemen? It pushes the two fingers into the esophagus and chokes you more, right? But how about if you pray? If you pray like this and step back, see how you pull more balance, all right? And he can't choke you when you're doing this and stepping back, and then you pull it in, all right? And then you can kick him bit or pop his eardrums. He did in the martial arts what everybody is supposed to do, and all the old masters did. In the Far East, they helped people. They gave of their time. They gave of their money. They help people. They help their students. He, he's, 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 the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the pure example. And unless he's from the village and he's a bad dude. <laughs> Instead of having an organization with his, he's, he's, he has a family, you see? As a good friend of mine says, you know, an org any organization can be split apart but a family can't be split. You can't. If, uh, you could interview some of the kids that are now adults, that they would tell you in very, very strong terms that their life was turned around by John Maniel. And I'm not talking about a few, I'm talking about dozens. But you mean Rumble Weiss? Yeah. Well, we will meet, the presidents, the leaders will meet with the rival gang. We will make the rules, what to bring to the Rumble, how we're gonna fight, what time it's gonna take place and we will meet down there. But like I said, no guns, no knives. It's just the, the best beating you can give the other guy without trying to kill him. And that's it, run towards each other and a good 15 minute fight. Now, was there a purpose to this? Was there some sort of territory or something involved? Sometimes it was territory wise. Sometimes it was respect wise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was just uh, like, uh, maybe one of us got too bored. It was a Saturday night. I came in Sunday morning. I remember I made the checks and I said, uh, a uh, young child, I think he was eight years old at the time, uh, was shot during a crossfire. And of course, 
there's always a public outcry when an innocent yeah. child is killed, especially when it's, you know, between two gangs. And that time then the city, you know, through City Hall and, you know, the bosses at one police plaza, you know, they turned on the heat and they wanted to put an end to these, you know, problems. And of course, if you're going to do gangs and you're going to do Sunset Park, you're going to run into John Menil. Uh I was home watching television. The news came on, big shootout, Fifth Avenue and 50. Second Street, eight-year-old kid standing in a bus stop waiting for a car service with his mother, got hit in the neck and dies. And I said, 52nd and 5th, familiar. Bang. I call the 68, the chief is there. He says, come in, Manito. I go in. He says, what do you think? I said, familiar. Their clubhouse is on 52nd and 6th. It's got to be familiar. There's a... a, a Above the shoe store, there's a dance, you know, where they run parties. FMDs were up at a party. Not armed, just up at a party. This is what turned out. Familia sees them. They run up to the clubhouse to get the guns, and they're shooting these guys, and this kid gets it with a shotgun slug through the neck. Eight years old kid. Nothing to do with this fucking bullshit. So now I pick up all the Familias, who all happen to be in bed that night at 10 o'clock according to their mothers and their friends. I watch those guys every night. They never go to bed before 4 o'clock in the fucking morning, you know? But that night, everybody went to bed. All right. I don't arrest them. I say, listen, this happened, this happened. I want you in the precinct with me because I'm doing an investigation. I'm not violating anybody's rights, you see? I'm doing it right. And I got eight familiars in the precinct, in a room, eating pizza and soda on me, waiting to see where this goes. And then I put this thing together. The writing, the A comes down. I get witness who finally say, fuck these gangs, because the neighborhood would never testify against the gangs. They were totally frightened of them. I get witnesses who finally say, this is bullshit. They're testifying against the gangs. And the DA says to me, can you pick these guys up? I said, yes. She said, how long is it going to take? I said, 30 seconds. She said, what are you talking about? I said, they're all in the room here. She said, don't tell me you lock them up, violated this. No. They're not here under arrest. They're here as my guest eating pizza and soda. Seven of them are right there that you want. This one you're going to let go. You're going to pick him up again because you're going to find out he was involved. And it's up to, they let him go. The next day, I had to go pick him up. It, it turns out all eight are convicted for one crime. All eight do heavy time. CO was seen by witnesses having a shotgun, so we figured his shotgun sluggers would kill the kid. So he was 14 years old, but he got the most time. I think he's in like 15 years now. He's the one in jail saying, I'm gonna kill that fucking motherfucker when I get out of jail. I'm gonna kill him, I'm gonna kill him. They're all gonna kill me. They're all gonna kill me, but walk down Fifth Avenue, and they all, hey, John, I, you know what a favor you did me when you locked me up? Everybody wants to kill you, but now they're all shaking my, what, are they gonna kill me by shaking my hands? Until I, till they melt me or what, you know? So they're gonna kill me. You know what I know? That's another thing. When my number's up, it's up. I'm a deputy chief of uh, Patrol Borough Brooklyn South, which encompasses 13 precincts. Uh, if you look over on the map here, if you look just below the 7-7, those 13 precincts <clears throat> on the lower half is known as Patrol Borough Brooklyn South. Uh, for the purposes of police administration, that's a borough. You've got about 15 or 20 percent uh, Asian. I think 8th Avenue has the, now the largest Asian uh, community outside of Chinatown. And for, in fact, in numbers, I think there are more Asians in that section of 7-2. Uh, seven, uh, seven and then, of course, you have Greenwood Cemetery there. So it's a very diverse neighborhood and has been as long as I've been here. Uh, Sunset Park is predominantly Hispanic. And it, it runs, when I say Hispanic, it runs the range from uh, all different uh, Spanish backgrounds, from Puerto Rican to Colombian to uh, Mexican to uh, whatever Spanish country you can imagine. We have somebody from Sunset Park. When we come back, one man can and did and does make a difference. Cop Talk, Behind the Shield, with the French Connection Cop, Sonny Grosso. I worked with a psycho for about uh, 14 years. Uh, Eddie Egan. I mean, everybody in the world called Eddie a psycho. I think that, I think you become a psycho, or at least labeled as a psycho, because certainly John is not a psycho, and certainly Eddie is not a psycho, but you become labeled as a psycho when you believe in something so strongly that's 
not so much detrimental to what everybody else believes in, but that you're willing in your belief of this thing is to do something about it. John didn't like the decimation that took place in the neighborhood. He didn't like the complete degradation that took place. He didn't like the disrespect that, that the kids were, were having in the neighborhood for people, for elders, for each other. And Eddie didn't like drug addicts, and he didn't like drug sellers. And I think that Eddie went in a fanatical way to do something about that, and John, in, in a fanatical way, went to do something about what he felt was oppressive. And I think, I, I don't mean fanatical that it is fanatical, we tend to think it's fanatical if they do something that we wouldn't do. He was headed for trouble. He went into the service. He signed himself in the service. And when I was in the Army, they used to pick on me and then, you know, call out, the company comes out, forms a circle, they put the gloves on and you fight. I used to kick the shit out of everybody. You know the deal, I call the number, whoever got the number is going to attack you, right? That's cool. Set it! Yummy! Fight! Yummy! 43! When I went to go on the police department, I was supposed to get appointed in 1961. The whole class got appointed and I didn't get appointed. Two years went by. And I called the department personnel and went down there. I said, how the fuck come everybody got appointed and I didn't? What's going on? Well, there's a little thing here, like your military records say, this man, if provoked, will lose his temper to a point where he would physically kill a man with his hands. So do you think that that's why you have a lot of anger? I don't have anger. That's the whole point. People mistake, I don't have anger. You think I do what I do out of anger? If I did what I did out of anger, there'd be an awful lot of people in the fucking hospital. I never shot anybody. I never kicked the shit out of anybody. Didn't pick their fucking hands up to me first. Oh, and I said to the guy, "Park the fucking car." He said, "The mayor's car." I said, "Are you a cop?" He said, "No, I'm a city motor vehicle operator. Park the fucking car. I'm gonna write it." He didn't park it. I wrote it. So what do you think I get? I get promoted. I swear, like three weeks later, a month later, I get called down for an interview for for plain clothes. The biggest tit job in the city of New York that you had to have a hook like this to get into? I just wasn't smart enough to realize I was being fucking set up. <laughs> Let's face it, who can trust a cop who don't take money? Because I just wouldn't take the envelopes. I was told if you don't take it and we go down, you're going down with us anyway. We're going to tell them that you took it too. I said, well, I have to take the chances. They had a code in those days that was phenomenal. You don't take money from DOAs. You know, if you find a dead body in the house, you don't loot the house. You don't take money if you find a guy in the street. You don't take drug money. You never take drug money. Gambling money's clean. We're not doing anything bad here. We're skimming a little gambling money. It's clean. It's not dope. It hurts nobody. Before Circle Cove, the whole plain clothes division was corrupt, wasn't it? The precincts were getting a nut. The, sit, the, the borough, the division, everybody was on. Everybody was taking bread. Was Serpico on the take? In my opinion, yes. I think that he got caught. They gave him immunity to prosecution. And then it just mushroomed. They made him a fucking hero. Never trusted another cop. Cops that wanted to talk to me, they knew the deal and we were friendly. And the guys that didn't, to me, they were just jealous. And I used to tell them, if you're jealous, gentlemen, do what I do, then you don't have to be jealous. You know? Don't make it an eight hour day, an eight and a half hour day. Give it a concerted effort. Give it four or five hours of your own time. Go out in the community. Instead of taking a kid or radio car down to the piers and beating his ass, take him out and buy him a pizza. Talk to him. You might get over. You might 
just find out that there's human beings out there besides us. John Manillo is a, was an unusual police officer. Uh, long before community policing became the vogue in New York City, John was the essence of community policing. He identified with the community that he worked in. In those days, the, the, the larger portion of the precinct was uh, predominantly Hispanic. And that was the area that he had his beat or his post, as we used to call them in those days. And he became very, very involved with the youth. He ran a karate school in the neighborhood. And he attracted a lot of the kids that were borderline cases from going towards a life of criminality and steered them into uh, a more productive uh, way of life. You'd be surprised if a kid has somebody to talk to, how their whole, you know, everything just changes. The problems that they think that are really serious just by talking to somebody are gone. You know? I never had that when I was a kid. I really didn't have anybody to talk to. I used to stand in the mirror and talk to myself and say, you know what you did today? You're a bad guy, you know. But really, that's, yeah, that would probably be my final thing. That, the Golden Eagle Youth Center would be the ultimate goal. And I wouldn't give a fuck if I was broke after I opened it. It was funny, back in the days when John wrote the, the script and what have you, and there was a whole group that uh, used to, sometimes he would have to elicit the help of a lot of other officers because the guy had gone really bad and he was, you know, and, uh, once they'd do the favor for John, he'd say, you'll be in my movie, you know? And, and then a month later, he'd have an argument with him. He'd say, you're out of it. You're out of it. You're out of the movie. <laughs> you're out of the movie. Maybe a walk-on part, but definitely not anything to say. You'll have nothing to say. <laughs> and that's my opinions and anybody who disagrees with him. And if I offended anybody with anything I said, fuck you, I meant it. You know. I've optioned my life story to fucking three major studios already. And I sat with their writers, and we've written it. And it's good. And then a studio head gets it and says, well, I don't like this, and change this, and do this. And then the writing gets it back and does six weeks worth of rewrites. Then they turn it in, and this thing sucks. Studio heads don't know how to rewrite screenplays. Why don't you leave the fucking things alone? They are insecure fucking people. They are so afraid of making a mistake that they're gonna lose their fucking job or something. They're a bunch of fucking morons. The people that I met in this business that run the studios are assholes. And then tell me, well, we have to change it because it's too much controversy. You knew the controversy. Why the fuck did you buy it? You knew the controversy that was involved in my life story. Then why the fuck did you buy it? Now you're gonna tone it down you're going to do it this way, and you're going to do it that way, and you're going to put in things that I never did, and you're making me look like some fucking comic book Superman that can't change it to his outfit anymore because there's no more fucking phone boots, because that's what it boils down to. And it's not my life story anymore. And it doesn't explain anything about me. It's violence and action and bullshit. That's all it is. You know what I want to do? Really? You know, my biggest ambition is I want to make a lot of money. I want to get down to 3rd Avenue and buy a warehouse and open up a youth center. And take all these kids off the street and give them martial arts and basketball and everything and see if donations can support it once I open it. That would be the final accomplishment. That's the thing that I really would love to do, even if I had to do it with my own money. You know why? Because the kids are the future of this world. Come on, let's send it on. Y'all want this party song? 
Set it off.